Hello, Space fans. Welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, we'll take a look back at some of what I think were some of the big stories of 2016. Okay, now, before we get started, let me just warn you that I'm a bit of a contrarian when it comes to space news. I have a particular bias that, just so you know, not everyone shares. Okay, for example... I don't find Pluto all that exciting. And I know you're all going to want me to mention the New Horizons flyby last July. And, well, there, I just did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was a big story, I know. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for exploring the solar system. I think it's hugely important. But in the end, after I saw that heart-shaped feature on the surface along with everyone else, I was kind of done. <laughs> Sorry. Um, still, I recognize it was a big deal, so it's in here. Also, I want to point out that when it comes to planetary science reporting, no one really does it better than Emily Lakdawalla, so I really don't even need to cover that, do I? Seems a bit redundant. Now, it was the same thing with the Water on Mars story. It was huge when it came out, and all the news channels covered it very well, but we've actually known about Water on Mars for a while now. Sorry. It's just that now we've actually seen it, so I guess that was kind of a big deal, too. But the kind of news that really turns my crank are the discoveries that involve the big picture. Stories that show us our place in the universe. That's why I'm such a long-time, devout Hubble hugger. Hubble consistently does that. It looks farther back in time than anything ever built and gives us a glimpse of the most distant reaches of the universe. I mean, come on, after all, this channel is called Deep Astronomy. <laughs> So with that in mind, here are my top news stories of 2015. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I love me some exoplanets. The fact that we now know there are more planets in the sky than stars is about as humbling a thing to know as understanding how the Hubble Deep Field was taken. Last summer, astronomers announced that they have found a planet very similar to Earth, called Kepler 452b. It's 1,400 light years away and is the smallest planet to date discovered orbiting in the habitable zone. Now, for those of you who don't know, the habitable zone is, you know what? You, you guys know what a habitable zone is by now. I'm not going to go into it. Look at any space fan news where I do a exoplanet story and you'll find out what a habitable zone is. <laughs> Kepler-452b is an older, bigger cousin to the Earth. It's larger than the Earth, it's, and it has a 385-day orbit, which is only 5% longer than ours. The planet is 5% farther from its parent star, Kepler-452, than Earth is from the Sun. Kepler-452b is 6 billion years old, 1.5 billion years older than our Sun. It has the same temperature, and is 20% brighter, and has a diameter 10% larger. So, there you go. It's all ready to move in. You just got to get there somehow. Astronomers using ESO's Very Large Telescope have discovered by far the brightest galaxy yet found in the early universe and found strong evidence that examples of the first generations of stars lurk within it. Now, when they say first generation, they mean the very first stars ever to shine in the heavens. And they've seen them. This is the kind of insight that the James Webb Space Telescope will give us when it launches in 2018. The first generations of stars are known as Population 3 stars and were born out of the primordial material from the Big Bang. All the heavier chemical elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and iron, which are essential to life, were forged in the bellies of stars. But this means that the first stars must have formed out of the only elements that could have existed prior to stars, hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium. These stars would have been enormous, several hundred or even a thousand times more massive than the sun, blazing hot and transient, exploding as supernovae only after about two million years. And until now, the search for physical proof of their existence hasn't been very conclusive. Last summer, astronomers used the VLT to peer back into the ancient universe, to a period known as reionization, which was approximately 800 million years after the Big Bang. Now, instead of conducting a narrow and deep study of a small area of the sky, they broadened their scope to produce the widest survey of very distant galaxies ever attempted. The team discovered and confirmed a number of surprisingly bright, very young galaxies, 
One of these, labeled CR7, was an exceptionally rare object and by far the brightest galaxy ever observed at this stage in the universe. And within it, the very first stars. So New Horizons flew by Pluto and saw this. Last July, we got our most detailed look yet at the minor planet Pluto as the New Horizons spacecraft flew past. The science and images are still coming in, but by all accounts, the mission was a spectacular success. 2015 marked the 25th year of science and observations of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was launched on April 24, 1990, and after a rocky start, has done more to advance our knowledge of the universe than any single instrument. So a major reason that Hubble has lasted so long is that it was designed to be repaired by the space shuttle and has had various upgrades, replacement, and repairs done on five separate occasions. The last one was in 2009, which basically made Hubble a brand new instrument. Now, Hubble is primarily an infrared telescope, which enables it to look back at distant, highly redshifted galaxies. It's expected to be in orbit for quite a while, and NASA is planning on operating Hubble well into the later part of this decade so it can overlap observations with its successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. Launched in October 2018. <laughs> Have to keep correcting it because I said the wrong date in the last one. Although they have no plans to bring Hubble down when the mission ends, one of the last things they did at the last shuttle repair mission was to attach a ring on the bottom of Hubble with the idea that, I don't know, maybe a motivated company or group of people could perhaps grab it with some kind of robotic craft and bring it down. I mean, at least the possibility exists, although I don't think anything will be done to try and grab Hubble and bring it back when the mission's over, but it would be pretty cool though, wouldn't it? Finally, to my mind, one of the most amazing stories in astronomy for 2015 was one that came out this December. Astronomers using Hubble as part of the Frontier Field Survey observed a supernova that they had actually predicted. It appeared right on time and exactly where they thought. I never thought I'd actually live to see the day when predictions like this could happen. But what happened was a supernova occurred in a very distant galaxy that Hubble would not have been able to see without the gravitational lensing of a foreground galaxy cluster known as Max J1149.5 plus 2223. Called Supernova Refsdal after a Norwegian astronomer, Sjur Refsdal, who, pro who first proposed using time-delayed images from a lens supernova to study the expansion of the universe way back in 1964. Anyway, the supernova was first imaged back in November 2014 and was seen as an Einstein cross around one of the foreground galaxies. And due to the nature of the visible and dark matter that made up the foreground galaxy cluster, astronomers knew that the light from the supernova would be split up like a light ray in a prism. And because of the different paths the light took, Another image of the supernova should appear later in 2015. So from models of the gravity lens produced by the cluster, astronomers tried to figure out when and where exactly it would show up in the cluster. Then, once they had their answer, they pointed Hubble back at the cluster, opened the shutter, and waited. Then, there it was, right where it should be. Now, I'm sorry, but... There's a lot of things that are like downtown, but that is just like downtown. <laughs> now, we did a Hubble Hangout on this a couple of weeks ago, and I put the link to it in the description box below. Okay, guys, I'm out of time for this week, space fans, and I didn't get a chance to go into what exciting things to look forward to in 2016, but I'll do a live stream next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S., and I'll tell you some of the things coming up that I'm excited about. I'll also take any questions or talk about anything else you guys want to, so please join me then. I've put a link to the stream in the description box as well. Well, that's it for this year, space fans. Thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up.